When you see the tribes going out to battle in the books of Moses or in the book of Joshua or even in the book of Judges, they say, whom shall we send first? He says, let Judah go first. God is saying, let praise go first. If you let praise go first, when you go into battle, you are going to win because I will hear your praises of me and I will respond. So it's a play on the words and also on the name of the tribe. Let Judah go first. So unfortunately, Judah was always the guy that got shoved up to the front, but you know, it, it, it was making a, a, a point. When we go into battle in this life, if we go into battle looking for a new job, if we go into battle with cancer, if we go into battle with, with uh, you know, a, a, a bad co-worker, or if we go into battle disagreeing with the Bible teacher, let praise go first. Let's take a moment and let's just simply praise God and then we'll be in right standing with Him. And then we can go on and we can enter the battle. Okay, that's the point he's making and it's not just a point for, for Old Testament. It's for all of us. Whenever you get up in the morning, the first thing you should say is, I'm going into battle. Praise your name, Lord. Thank you for another day. Whatever. Just let, what, what does Paul say? Um, uh, uh, pray without ceasing and rejoice continuously. Uh, rejoice without ceasing, I think. Or pantote uh, carte, which is um, rejoice without ceasing. Or always rejoice. Always rejoice. Pantote carte. And that's the shortest sentence in the, new, in the whole Bible. Not just the New Testament, but the whole Bible. People say Jesus wept is, but it's not. In Greek, it's idakrosen o Jesus. So it's actually longer in Greek, the original language, than pantote charete, which is to rejoice always. Okay, so wake up and praise. Go to bed and praise. When you face the battle, praise. Anyway, I didn't mean to divert so much, but I, I just love what the Bible tells us. These little hints. How we conduct our lives will establish us in how we our lives are conducted, I guess I should say. Right, okay, go ahead. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Which was fulfilled, once again, first one into battle. Their hand will be on the neck of their enemies. And it's also a, uh, uh, looking forward to Jesus, too, because Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. And he is the one. He will dash them with the iron scepter, etc. Okay, so his hand is going to be on the neck of his enemies. In Isaiah 64, I think it is, it talks about him stomping out the grapes of wrath, which we talked about here yesterday, Sunday, yeah, yesterday in uh, the uh, Revelation class. So it's, it's also a prophecy of the coming Messiah in veiled terminology. Go ahead. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. That is definitely a prophecy of Jesus because it's not, it's not just the tribe of Judah. Yes, they are the seat of government. And yes, the people come to Judah to do the worship in the temple. But Ed is specifically saying that the, your father's brothers will bow down to you. That is fulfillment of Joseph's dream who was being a picture of the coming Redeemer. The 12 sons, right? He's, he's confirming that, that it will be fulfilled in Judah. Okay, which means Jesus, the son of Judah. Okay, well, before we go on, and real quickly, I've said this before, but some of you may not have been here for that. This is the name of God. Yod, Hey, Vav. I know my handwriting is terrible. I'm sorry. That's the, the divine name, Jehovah. Jehovah, okay? How would we know? What? How would we know? Well, yeah. you can just look. It's pretty bad handwriting. Okay, the, the name of Judah is Yod, Ya, Hu, same, that's a, I know that's a terrible fav, but it is. Anyway, and then, same word, but they add in a Dalit, okay? Jehovah, Judah. And interestingly enough, Dalit, which I've said before, is the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it has a specific meaning. Each one of these has a meaning. The meaning of the Dalit is, believe it or not, door. Jesus is the door to the tribe of Judah and the door to Jehovah. In other words, coming through the tribe of Judah is the door which is Jehovah God. Do you see that? And this isn't a mistake. This isn't just some, oh, I'm going to look at the Hebrew language and make something up out of my head. The Hebrew language is Everything in this Bible, and I've showed you a couple of them, the generations, how certain letters, the Vav will miss in different places. Everything about this language and every letter that is in the, the Hebrew Bible has a meaning from God. I, I am 100% sure of that. We could go on with stuff like this all day, and it's no coincidence. It all points to Jesus, but that's kind of interesting. So that's who we're talking about right now is Judah, but Jesus is the door to God. It's coming through the tribe of Judah. Go ahead. 
Judah is the lion's whelp. Okay, once again, the lion. What does it say in the book of Revelation? Lion of Judah. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay, fulfilled in the last book of the Bible, which is mentioned here in the first book of the Bible. Okay. Uh, from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a crouched as a lion, and as an old lion who shall rouse him up. That was couched, not crouch. Crouched. <laughs> oh, couched. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, till Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Okay, now that is kind of veiled, but Shiloh is, at this point, in this verse, it is a picture or it's a name of the coming Messiah. You're going to see different names used. A star shall come out of uh, uh, Israel or Jacob in um, uh, Balaam's prophecy at the end of Numbers. Well, And that star is a, a, a prophecy of the coming Messiah. Shiloh has always been understood as the Messiah to come. Okay, so it says the scepter, meaning the the ruling authority of Israel, shall not depart from Judah. Okay, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, meaning that the kingly line is going to be preserved until the Messiah comes, until Shiloh comes, and to him, capital H in this Bible, because they clearly understood this is speaking of the coming Messiah. To him shall be the obedience of the people. Okay. Um, this is, and once again, I don't personally get into astronomy. It's not my thing, and I try to stay away from it simply because I don't understand the stars, and uh, I, I'm not big on, uh, people can misinterpret things is what I'm getting at. But I have said before that constellations are real. Constellations were set in the, the stars or in the, the, the heavens by God. And we know this how. I've asked this before. How do we know that they are divinely orchestrated arrangement of stars? What? Says Job says so. Job the book of Job. Job. He, he mentions uh, Maserot and the bear, Orion. He mentions these Octurus. He mentions these constellations. And he says, I'm the one that put these in place. They have a meaning. And they actually have a prophetic significance. And I've mentioned this book before, and it is worth reading. It's short. You can read it right online. It's called The Witness of the Stars. E.W. Bollinger, and he takes what has been manipulated by man over the years into that, uh, what do you call it, zodiac and all this crazy stuff, yeah. and he goes back to the original intent of it, what this originally meant and how it pictures everything in the heavens that's going over our heads throughout the night, which I don't even look up at him because I just don't want to get involved in, in the wrong type of worship. I do thank the Lord for him, but um, uh, he shows you how it is an unfolding picture of God's plan for redemption. I mean, it is astounding to read his works. It, it really is. He, he really thought this through. But um, this part, and you're right, because Genesis also mentions the, uh, the constellations, and this is what it's speaking of in this particular thing. It's speaking of a constellation. Here's what it means. It says, um, uh, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. The lawgiver, I believe, is the planet Jupiter. I may be wrong on that, but I think it's, it's uh, Jupiter is considered the, the planet of the lawgiver. Whichever planet it is, the constellation of Leo is here in the heavens, and Jupiter has always or had always been, and we can go back on the Starry Night program and we can verify this, it has always been in a certain place, mm -hmm. and it was there until the time of the Messiah. So it did not depart until Shiloh came. So this is all verifiable, and it's you want to stay away from astrology. Astrology is forbidden in the Bible. Divination is forbidden in the Bible. But when God puts a sign in the heavens, which he goes right back to Genesis 1, verse 8, or whatever it is, he says, these shall be to you for signs and for seasons. And he uses signs even before seasons. These are signs so that you can know the times that are coming. And then he gives you certain signs in the Old Testament pointing to the coming Messiah. The Magi knew that Christ was come because of the sign in the heavens. But you have to be careful with these things and make sure that it follows the pattern given by God and not by people misrepresenting these things. Yes? There is a, a great DVD on the Star of Bethlehem. Oh. I uh, just saw it um, last week. Um, and um, very much of what you are saying and and the way he ended it, it was just so very good. 
uh, and the way he ended it was that God, uh, before the foundations of the world, when he created everything, right. he put, put it put in, the plan in the stars. In the stars. And he probably got his information from Bollinger, who I believe did. I would not I, be at go all read the witness of the now. stars and compare them, and I'll bet you he got a lot of his information from there. Bollinger this, knew what he was this talking is about. The attorney that made this, huh. he said, you know, this was. The, the way he got into this was that he was asking his church to teach something. And he was he was kind of like you saying, well, I don't want anything to do with the stars. Right. Uh, he had always been taught because of astrology. you got to be really he careful with it. away from the stars. So um, um, a friend loaned that to me, and I would suggest any of you. Just it. watching it. Wow. Well, it is just that's what he's little talking little about right here. It's yeah. all in the Bible. It's it's not unbiblical, but you have to be careful that it follows God's plan. And this yeah. is God's plan here. That the scepter, whatever, it, Regulus is the name of it in uh, Latin. About that. And yeah. I think Regulus, Regulus is Jupiter. Jupiter. I may be wrong. No, they're two different. Are they? Uh, anyway, Regulus. The king. The king. King, Jupiter stars, the, king the authority, planet. the scepter. And Regulus was the king star. Okay. okay. Yeah. And, and these things are moving around and they are actually doing what God pre-programmed from together. our perspective. Right. They came together at that one time when Christ, when the man And then they separated and they're not, but it, it showed a fulfillment of this. But it's also yes. a literal fulfillment in the person of Jesus, the scepter not departing from the people of Israel. So if you look at it this way, the people of Israel, not the church, the people of Israel are written in the stars and God's plan is written in the stars what's going on on earth has a prophetic fulfillment it, it, it's beyond my comprehension and the, the, the funny thing about it is that it's all based on looking from our perspective you can't go to another planet and have these work because you're at a different angle in the stars yes. everything and I would guess and I may be wrong in this but I would guess it's not only from our perspective but it's probably specifically from Jerusalem in other words, you're going to get a different perspective from different parts of the earth, but I would guess, I, I, I don't know anything about stars, but that would be my guess is that all of this is written in the heavens and you have to be in Jerusalem to actually understand it and it's correct. Or Montana. Whatever. Or Montana. Oh boy, was that beautiful. But anyway, very cool stuff, but that's as far as I'm ever going to go on talking about stars and, and science in the sky because it's not my thing. But um, anyway, um, somebody, he left, so somebody please start with um, 11. He ties his foal to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. Okay, now, I don't know. This is not mentioned in the New Testament, but it could be a picture of when he rode the, the donkey into Jerusalem. Now, it doesn't say that. It's not a fulfillment in the New Testament, but it does say that he's taking the donkey's colt, which he did ride on, yeah. into Jerusalem and maybe tied it to a vine. But once again, he is the vine. Okay, I am the vine, you are the branches. And what that is signifying is that goes back to um, Ezekiel chapter, let me see if I can find this without wasting your time. Like I said, th this book, this Bible is just new, and so I don't have all of this in here. But it's talking about, I'll see if I can find it very quickly, and if I can, I'm not going to waste your time on it, but um, uh, it's a short chapter in the book of Ezekiel, very short chapter, and it's speaking about the vine, Israel being the vine, and the burnt, what good is the vine um, is it, it might be. It's it's right in that area. Um, let's see here. 18. Good and, good and vine. That's it. Okay. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, how is wood of the vine better than any other wood? The vine branch which is among the trees of the forest. Okay. This is speaking about the land of Israel. Okay. The vine has absolutely no use at all except for growing grapes. None. And he's making that point. Is wood taken from it to make an object? The answer is no. Can a men make a peg from it to hang a vessel on? No. In other words, the, the, the vine of the the, the 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 vine for grapes is it's useless for nothing except producing grapes. Okay? Is um, instead it is thrown into the fire for fuel. It's just it's it's use, useless wood except for. In other words, we know that oak can be used for certain things. We know that mahogany and teak and all these can be used for. But he's saying the vine is good for one thing. And he's saying you are the vine. And if you're not doing your job bearing fruit, the, oh, there's only one thing to do with you. Throw you into the fire, right? Okay? Indeed, um, it was a whole object could be made from it. How much less will, will, um, will it be useful for any work when the fire has devoured it and it is burned? Saying, when my judgment comes on you, you're going to be worth less than nothing. Okay? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, like the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest, which I have given you, fuel for the fire, so I will give up 
the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will set my face against them, and I will... Okay, so he, it's a very short chapter. It's only eight verses. 